In this video, we're going to look at the concept of elemental analysis. And this is another component of chemical formulas because uh, elemental analysis is used to determine or is the first step in determining um, what a chemical formula is. Or in essence, it's the first step in determining um, what percentage of each element is contained inside of a particular compound. So what is elemental analysis? Well, there's a couple of different types, but the one that we talk about in general chemistry is uh, combustion analysis. So when you take a hydrocarbon or a, a compound that consists of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and you burn it or you combust it, um, basically what you do is you take that compound, you add oxygen, and then it forms carbon dioxide and water. So when you light a fire with wood, for example, or when you do like a when you gr use your gas grill, um, you're taking a hydrocarbon. Um, wood is is basically a hydrocarbon, and uh, propane is a hydrocarbon. You combine that with oxygen, and it makes carbon dioxide and water. So combustion uh, of compounds containing carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Uh, yields only CO2 and water um, when you when you combust them. So um, we can use this fact, and if we can collect the carbon dioxide and water, we can get information about what was contained inside that molecule. So to kind of show you in a chemical formula, if we have something that's CxHyOz plus oxygen. This is going to give us carbon dioxide and water. That's the definition of a combustion reaction. So what's interesting about this is that um, because of conservation of mass, the only carbon in this formula in the reactants is in the uh, hydrocarbon itself. So all of the carbon that winds up in the product has had, had to have come from that hydrocarbon. So in the end, if we're able to collect all of the carbon dioxide and figure out how much carbon dioxide was produced, we can we can then figure out how much carbon was in that carbon dioxide and then work back to get how much carbon was in that original sample. And the same thing is true for hydrogen. So if you look at the reactants, the only place that you find hydrogen is in the hydrocarbon. Now oxygen, on the other hand, is found in two places. You have oxygen that's from the air, the O2, and you have oxygen from the hydrocarbon. So it turns out that we can't use the oxygen in the CO2 in the water because we don't know what oxygen came from the hydrocarbon and we don't know what oxygen came from the um, air. So the, the two that we do know is that the carbon in CO2 came from the unknown. And the same is true for the hydrogen in the H2O came from the unknown. So if we work back, we can then figure out taking the mass of the carbon divided by the total mass of the unknown, this is going to allow us to get the percent of carbon in the unknown. And we do this by conservation of mass, because remember, all of this, the carbon in the CO2 um, came from that hydrocarbon. So if we take that mass of the carbon in the CO2 and we divide it by the total mass of the unknown, we can now get a percent. And obviously you would multiply this by 100 to get a percent, or you could get the fraction if you don't multiply it by 100. So that's the fundamental process of elemental analysis. Basically, you burn a hydrocarbon, you collect the products, you separate them into carbon dioxide and water, you weigh them to get a mass, and then you got to figure out how much of each, how much of the elements were in there. Now, you can do this for other things also. You can also do this for other elements besides carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. In the example we're going to do today, we don't actually look at that. Um, specific point, but it's the same exact process. It doesn't really, it doesn't make a difference. You're going to do the exact same steps. For example, if you had a, a, uh, an unknown that had CX, HY, OZ, and then we also added to that some sulfur, which we didn't know. And let's say that's A, sulfur A. We don't know how much sulfur was in that original compound. Well, in this case, it's going to make three different products. We're going to make CO2 plus H2O, and we're going to make sulfur dioxide, for example. Now, you don't have to know 
the products. Like we're not going to ask you to predict the products. We're going to give you the chemical reaction. But you, what you have to know is that in this case, the carbon comes from the car, the carbon and the carbon dioxide comes from the carbon. The hydrogen in the water comes from the hydrogen. And the only place that the sulfur could have come from was from the sulfur. The sulfur in the original comp, in the SO2 could have come from the original compound. So you see how this kind of works. It doesn't just have to be carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. It could be other elements. But what you're looking for are elements that only appear... Oh, and I should write that there's plus O2 for this. Um, elements that only appear in the unknown are going to be in the discrete um, compounds that are produced. And then the oxygen, because we add oxygen to it, that we can't get anything from. And I'm going to show you how to handle the oxygen at the very end. Okay, so here's a discussion problem, discussion problem two, that involves elemental analysis. So this says ascorbic acid, also referred to as vitamin C, is a key dietary nutrient, nutrient and is a powerful antioxidant. The first step in, de in determining the structure of ascorbic acid was to perform an elemental analysis. So we take 3.87 grams of the ascorbic acid, and this gives 5.80 milligrams of the CO2 and 1.58 milligrams of H2O on combustion. So there you go. We're taking 3.87. 87 milligrams of the unknown compound, and we're making 5.80 milligrams of CO2, and we're making 1.58 milligrams of the H2O. So I'm kind of just putting that all in. Then it says calculate the mass percentage of each element in this compound if it contains only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So here's the setup. Now we know that the carbon that's in that carbon dioxide uh, this 5.80 milligrams, the carbon that comprises this 5.80 milligrams, that had to have been in the original sample. And the hydrogen that was in this this uh, water had to have come from the original sample also. So we can start to work through this and figure it out. There are two ways of doing it. And for carbon, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you both ways. Uh, the first way is the way that I'm going to go through in detail, and the second way I'm going to mention, because in essence they're the same, it's just I'm going to point it out in the stoichiometry, not in the stoichiometry, in the unit conversions, that what we're doing is, is we're really just figuring out a percent of carbon and carbon dioxide. So what we need to do is we need to take our 5.80 milligrams of CO2, and we need to get a number of milligrams or grams. It doesn't make a difference. Um, in this case, we can go to milligrams of carbon. And the reason for that is we got to extract out how much we got to figure out how much carbon was in that original sample, because in the end, what we need is to get our percent carbon. We need to get our mass of carbon divided by the total mass. And in this case, we have the total mass, which is 3.87 milligrams but we don't have the mass of carbon. That's what we need to figure out. And that mass of carbon is coming from the carbon in the CO2. So let's start to work through this um, and, and figure this out. So to, to do this, we have to bring back our understanding of the mole, because we know that for every one mole of CO2, there is one mole of carbon. So to get to get to this, we need to have a unit conversion that's going to allow us to get to moles of CO2. So in essence, what we have to do is we have to get to, if we can get to moles of CO2, we can then get to moles of carbon by knowing that there's one mole of CO, one mole of carbon for every one mole of CO2. And then finally, we can get to the mass of carbon using the molecular weight. So this involves those unit conversions that we were playing with with the mole. So let's kind of review how to do that. So step one, we have to get this out of milligrams because milligrams is not going to work molecular weights. Our molecular weights are going to be in grams per mole. So we got we to gotta just do a quick unit conversion to get us into grams. And to do that, we have to remember our unit conversions and how we go from one unit uh, of, grams, of milligrams to another unit of grams. So what we remember is that there are 1,000 milligrams for every one gram. Or you can say that there are 10 to the minus 3 grams for every 1 milligram, however you want to write it. It doesn't matter. If you memorize the table, you could do the 10 to the minus 3 grams um, over 1 milligram, or you could write 1,000 milligrams um, for every 1 gram. But now what we have is we have grams of CO2. And we want to go to moles of CO2. So when we want to go from grams to moles, we have to use the molecular weight because that molecular weight is what allows us to go from moles 
two grams. So if we remember our chart, and then we also can do the number of things using Avogadro's number, but we don't need that in this case. But we do need the molecular weight to go from grams to moles. So in this case, we're going to figure out our molecular weight of carbon dioxide, which is 44.0 uh, grams of CO2 for every one mole. That's our molecular weight. Now, the reason why I put grams on the bottom is so that grams cancel. So we've gotten rid of milligrams, we've gotten rid of grams, and now we have moles of CO2. Now, we know that for every one mole of CO2, there is one mole of carbon. And we know that from our understanding of chemical formulas. Um, in the CO2 molecule, there's one mole of carbon and two moles of oxygen. So we, we have that. So we've now converted two moles of carbon, and we can get to a mass of carbon by saying, well, for every one mole of carbon, there is 12.01 grams of it. And I get that 12.01 grams from the periodic table. That's the atomic mass for carbon. So now the last step, and you can this is can be your choice. Um, the way that I set this up was I left this in milligrams. You can convert the 3.87 uh, milligrams to grams if you want and keep everything in grams. Um, or you can leave it as 3.87 milligrams and then calculate your mass of carbon in, in milligrams. It doesn't make a difference. What's important is that the unit on top and the unit on bottom stays the same. So we'll just, we'll just do a quick conversion. For every one gram, there's 1,000 milligrams to get us back to milligrams. 1.58 milligrams of carbon out of that. So if you look at what we did, um, so the way that I figured that out was I took 5.80 and then I multiplied it by one, multiplied it by one, multiplied it by one. You don't actually have to do that in your calculator. What you're doing is you're taking 5.80, you're multiplying it by 12.01, then you're multiplying it by 1,000. Then you push the divide button and divide it by 1,000, push the divide button and divide it by 44, and that's going to get you the 1.58 milligrams. Now, if you look at all these unit conversions, what we really have done is we're really taking the mass of the carbon divided by the molecular weight. So built into here, this is the percent of carbon in CO2. So another way that you can do this, or the, it's really the fraction of carbon in CO2, another way that you could do this is you could simply take the 5.80 milligrams times the fraction of carbon in CO2, and that's going to give you the mass of carbon that was contained in that sample. Both of these methods will work. We prefer that you do the, the unit conversions because that shows us that you know what's going on. But you are welcome to use this equation uh, if you like. It's just that if you can do the above now, you're going to get very. That's going to be very helpful to you as you go into the next couple of sections because we're going to need to be able to do these unit conversions relatively quickly um, on the exam. So, but both of these things will work, and they're both equivalent to each other. One is doing the unit conversions to figure it out, and the other one is using percent composition. So now if we want to figure out the percent of carbon in the unknown, that's going to be 1.58 milligrams divided by uh, 3.87 milligrams times 100. So that's going to give us 40.8% carbon. And we can do the same thing for hydrogen. So for hydrogen we have 1.58 milligrams of H2O. And at the very end here, we want to get milligrams of hydrogen. So we're going to continue kind of on a very similar line. We're going to convert this to grams. We're going to divide by the molecular weight of, of water, which is 18.02 grams per mole of water. And now we're going to have to create a, a new unit conversion for how many moles of hydrogen there are per mole of water. So for every one mole of H2O, there's really, there are two moles of hydrogen. So when we do our unit conversion here, for every one mole of H2O, there are two moles of hydrogen. And then we can come out and we can convert our, uh, for every mole of hydrogen, we can use the molecular weight, 1.008 grams. And then we can then convert this grams back to milligrams. For every one gram, there's 1,000 milligrams. 
So now that we have our unit conversions all set up, we can take the 1.58 milligrams of water, multiply that by 2, multiply that by 1.008, multiply that by 1,000, divide by 1,000, uh, and then we divide by 18.02 grams. And from that, we're going to get 0 0.177 milligrams of hydrogen. So if we want to calculate our percent hydrogen, we're going to take 0 0.177 milligrams divided by 3.87 milligrams, and then we're going to multiply that by 100, and this is going to give us 4.57% hydrogen in our compound. Now the question is, is this asks us to also calculate the mass of all three elements. So we have the mass of carbon, we have the mass of hydrogen, how do we get the mass of oxygen? How do we get the percent of oxygen? And the issue here is we can't do anything with the oxygen in the carbon dioxide or the water because that comes from a mixture of the oxygen in the compound and the oxygen in the air. So we have to do something different. So the way that we can think about this is we know our percent carbon, which is equal to 40.8%. We know our percent hydrogen, which is equal to 4.57%. And we know our percent oxygen. We don't know our percent oxygen. That's an unknown. So the compound itself is made up of three things: uh, C, H, and O. And those three things have to add up to 100%. So the total combined percentage has to be 100%. That's due to the law of conservation of mass. So what we can say is that 100% has to equal the percent carbon plus the percent hydrogen plus the percent oxygen. So if we plug in, we can take our 40.8% plus our 4.57% plus our percent oxygen, which we don't know. We can solve for that percent oxygen, which is going to equal 54.6%. So what we did was we solved for the percent oxygen by knowing the percent of all of the other elements. And then uh, through con the law of conservation of mass, we figured out what the percent of oxygen was in that compound. So that is how elemental analysis works. Um, again, just to kind of recap some of the main points. Elemental analysis will give you, is where you combust a hydrocarbon with an un, unknown set of elements. It could be carbon, hydrogen, or any other um, elements that would go into a hydrocarbon, sulfur, nitrogen, whatever it is. And then that's going to produce a series of um, products that contain the elements plus oxygen, like carbon dioxide, water. If, for example, you had sulfur, it would be sulfur dioxide. If you had nitrogen, it could be nitrogen dioxide. You use the, the mass of those things to work back and figure out how much of each element was in the original sample. You come up with your percentages, and then you can work out the percent oxygen by um, figuring out what the difference is from 100%.